I jumped up and my microphone went flying. Good morning, everybody. And welcome, and a warm welcome to those who join us later online. We're so glad um, that you will be listening in. Two quick announcements from me. Uh, one is that we are going to do another rocket launch VBS this summer in July. It's in your bulletin. And what I mean by that is uh, Lakeside will plan the morning, and we're coordinating with Voyager Village, and they'll have kids' activities in the afternoon, which will boost you know, both organizations, we hope. And then we're Palm Sunday is the 24th of this month, coming up quickly. And that day, we're, because we're, we don't have the bandwidth um, to do a Monday, Thursday service, we're going to kind of combine Palm Sunday and um, Monday, Thursday in the same service. And then I tell my congregations always, you must come to Good Friday, if at all possible. Otherwise, Jesus is never in the tomb for you, so there is no resurrection on Easter Sunday. So uh, high, uh, looking for high attendance at the Good Friday service. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we are taking orders for the annual flower garden that will be here on Easter morning for you all to see. You'll see that there is a insert in your bulletin, it's yellow. Um, fill it out and put, put your choice. You can choose one or two or three items and um, then just return it with your check to the offering as you are leaving church today. And there's three different kinds of flowers. There, there's the Easter lily, the begonia, and the calantula. That's it. Okay. The <clears throat> pronunciation is not the name of my game. Uh, and then if, if you happen to come during the week, there is a sign-up sheet also in the narthex, narthex, and you can use one of the envelopes that are down in front of the easel for your um, check. Okay, thank you. It's in the bulletin, but just a strong reminder to try to bring some guests, if you can, to our March 10th service, because Mark Cedio, who is a nationally renowned organist, uh, is having a little mini recital for us after the service. So it's a great time to worship people and bring the fellowship and bring them here to show uh, the community what we're all about. So mark that down. And one last one. Um, I'm calling all our cut-ups, strippers, rippers, and pedal to the metal gales. We're out of quilt tops and we need help. So we're going to do a March Madness for quilters on 313, which is a Wednesday. We'll start after yoga, uh, 1030, and we'll go till about 3. Uh, plan to bring something to share for lunch. Dessert will be provided. And there's no experience necessary necessary. We have all kinds of jobs to do to get those done and um, it'll just be good help for us to keep our quilters going. We've already packed about 160 quilts so we want to reach our goal of 250. So if you can come out and help us that would be great and it's just some good fellowship time together. Thank you. Stand as you're able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who writes the law on our hearts, who draws all people together through Jesus. Amen. Held in God's mercy, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Holy God, we confess that we are caught in snares of sin and cannot break free. We hoard resources while our neighbors are hungry and cold. 
We speak in ways that silence others. We are silent when we should speak up. We keep score in our hearts. We let hurts grow into hatred. For all these things, sins only you know. Forgive us, Lord. Here is a flood of grace. Out of love for the whole world, God draws near to us, breaks every snare of sin, washes away our wrongs, and restores the promise of life through Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading for today is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. And this is the story of Moses going to the top of the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, so listen carefully. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord, that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God, the word of life. Our psalm for today is Psalm 19 and we'll read it responsively. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tales to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, sound has gone out in all the lands, a message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber, it rejoices like a champion to run its course. Nothing is hidden. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revised the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just. Rejoice the heart. 
The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to me. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More than much fine gold, sweeter far for me, and honey in the comb. By them also is your servants enlightened, and in keeping them there is a great reward. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall be whole and sound, and innocent of a great offense. Our second reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. The word of God, the word of life. Holy Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken, the gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. Dearly beloved, grace and peace to you from the living one, the Christ. Amen. Imagine this, a sunny courtyard the size of several football fields made of large stones and surrounding the Jerusalem temple. The temple sits on one end and there was a stone wall about so high and it was enormous. And out in that large area, the ordinary people could be, but as you came closer to the building, only special people could be in there. All along this stone um, fence, along the outside of the courtyard, would be booths. There'd be maybe blankets separating some 
larger animals, there'd be smaller animals, there were tables of things, there were birds in cages, and so on. Mothers, you can imagine, it's Passover and people are try, try to get to Jerusalem for Passover and they're, they're parents telling their kids to behave and to not go too far away and men standing around telling jokes and stories, catching up on the news, everyday people coming into that courtyard to stand where they can and pray. The faithful love God's law, as the psalm says today, it's like honey, and they recite it day and night. Now there's a whole system in place to uphold this day of Passover. It's called the Korban system, K-O-R-B-A-N, Korban. When God's law is broken and you want to come to the festival, you have to atone for your sins. People need a way to draw closer to God. So the booths are filled with korbanim, the proper sacrifices. There were certain things um, that were characteristic of animals that, were, that had to be present and things had to be without blemish, you know, as parts of the Old Testament say. So if you have a large problem with God, a large sacrifice is offered, a smaller problem, and it's a dove. Korban literally means to draw near, and it also means sacrifice. Draw near and sacrifice, the same words, and they, these sacrifices are the people's way of drawing near to God and God drawing near to them, korban. Now imagine some people are carrying their own doves because buying doves at the temple is expensive. Some people have come a long way and they can't possibly bring animals, so they're bargaining with the sellers in the booths. And since Roman currency, the currency of the ordinary people, is stamped with Caesar's image, they can't use it in there. In, it's not allowed and must be exchanged for temple money. That costs something too. The system is a market opportunity because those who inspect the offerings might reject a sacrificial animal and in doing so create a sales opportunity for their brother. There are lots of priests and sellers and money changers in order to support this temple sacrifice system and it was a busy time because it's Passover. Imagine there's a woman in ordinary cl clothing arguing with a money changer that he has cheated her. A father leaving the temple grounds with his family leading the rejected offering behind. Some can't come in to the grounds at all. They are too poor. The poorest then are kept away from God in this system. The poorest can't draw near. They can't afford the method of doing it. Suddenly, a man rushes over to the animals and lets them free and the birds go flying and the money changers table is turned over and this man chases them all out and calls down judgment on the temple and says a new one's going to be raised in three days. Our gospel story today is not a story, as I've heard sometimes, about gambling. Jesus wasn't upset that money was changing hands, nor is it a story about how Jesus is just like us, expressing anger sometimes. Well, that's kind of interesting. It's not about any of those things. It's not about Jesus being against the free market. It's about korban, the way people draw near to God about their sacrifices and how all of it is ruined when some are being kept away. After Jesus dies, the system opens to all 
40 years after Jesus dies, the temple is torn apart. Jesus becomes the korban, the sacrifice, the way people draw near to God, and he is raised up in three days. We still need that nearness to God because the one who created all things can seem far away. How could one who organized the entire universe be interested in whether we poor small things get sick or not, or whether we're doing okay with our families, or whether our community is doing okay? God can seem far away. Sometimes it can be hard to draw near. So we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Sometimes we might feel defiant, but oftentimes it is that no matter what we do, we can't seem to locate God even when we need God. Or sometimes someone makes it clear we're unwanted, like the religious officials in Jesus' time, the church sometimes erects barriers, sometimes grief or the burdens of life drive us away from our church community and away from God. God has known all this about us for a very long time. Mick read the Ten Commandments basically this morning. Remember the Sabbath day because it's so hard to feel away from God. We need Korban too because we as human beings are generally able to mess many things up and regardless God is always willing to build a bridge to draw us near. Our part is to show up, to pray, to hold out our hands, to embrace one another with care. All we have to do is reach out in love even to those we don't know. God draws near in these mysteries the mysteries of making a quilt, the mystery of bringing communion to someone, the mystery of helping someone out with a meal when they need it. And as we spend our lives on others, friends, family, children, the poor, our neighbors, as we invest in all of them, our lives are rich. When we die to ourselves as Jesus did, when we draw near, we have purpose, and our lives are filled. Our hearts and minds fill. When our attention leaves our navel, so does our despair. It's in dying to ourselves we find who we are and what we love. And that's the truth of so many of our institutions. Marriage, religious life, parenting, sacrifice is at the heart of it. Korban, and God was willing to do that too. Lent's a time of fasting, almsgiving, a time of sacrifice, a quiet time, but not a depressing time for me. We discover our life when we engage in these practices of sacrifice. We draw near to God and to one another. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, the worship service is called the Korbana, the drawing near time. And as we are together on a Sunday morning, it is also Korbana for us. So today, the invitation to you is to draw near to one another, to the whole world, to the places you long to see, the ones you've left behind, to all of your neighbors, great and small. As you listen and sing, as you give, you draw near, and you are invited to draw even closer to one another, to forgive, to hold one another up in love, to tend to one another's wounds. I had a fun parishioner one time who about half the time would come in my office and tell me he thought he was an atheist. And he was a curmudgeon. In fairness to him, he had pain a lot of the time, but I'm, I'm guessing he was a curmudgeon long before he had his arthritis. He would come often into my uh, office and shoot the breeze. A brilliant guy, one time he came into my office, he said, 
I can't decide if everything in the universe is alive or if it's all dead. And those were the kinds of conversations that we had. Well, he had a friend who got tired of him on the one hand saying he thought he might be an atheist and on the other hand being in church every single week. And so he wondered to Steve, why would he bother to do that? Why come to church? And Steve described it this way. When one of our members lost her hair because she was in chemo, she came to church anyway. At first, she tried wearing a wig. Nice wig, everybody said. Then she couldn't stand how hot and itchy it was, so she started to come in a scarf. Nice scarf, everybody said. Finally, that also was too irritating, so she just came to church as she was, bald head and all, and he said, we got to watch her hair slowly growing back in. She is beautiful to me. When we are at our best, our most holy, we are drawing near to God, to one another, to the world, to the word, Lent calls us to that place. It's a holy place. Prayer, fasting, almsgiving, not for their sake, and not so that everybody can look at us and say, oh, what a, what a good person he is, what a good person she is. Not for their sake, for ours. We empty ourselves, and then we're re reassured again that at the center of all reality, in the most broken place, is Christ who gives himself away and the cross reminds you of that, how beloved you are. God would rather die than give you up. We who follow the beloved son are the beloved. We can empty ourselves, we can laugh at ourselves, we can hold one another close because of Christ's life and death. Lent, the whole season, gives us a reason to reflect on the meaning and the purpose and the promise of our lives as creatures of God. Today, Jesus upends the religious system because it's keeping people away. No wonder they all wanted him dead. But even as they killed him, they brought the whole world closer to God because Jesus, the Christ, is now our way, our way always to draw near to God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Catholic the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. You alone are God. We thank you for the gift of Sabbath rest and the time we can spend together. Awaken the church to the mystery of your presence and give us glad hearts as we receive the good news of your deliverance. Hear us, O God. You judge the nations. We pray for an end to war and strife in every land, especially Ukraine, Palestine, and Israel. Strengthen international efforts to negotiate peace and provide humanitarian aid to people fleeing from conflict. Hear us, O God. You bring healing and hope. We give thanks for physicians, nurses, researchers, therapists, public health workers who prevent and treat illness, and our first responders who fearlessly address every emergency. We pray for any who are sick, especially Marilyn, Dave, Elaine, Clint, Anne, Faith, Mark, Miranda, Don, Nona, Judy, Barb, and Dorothy. Hear us, O God. You bring life to death. We remember our loved ones who have died, confident that they have new life in you. May we trust that nothing can separate us from your love, that you will always draw us near. Hear us, O God. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our heart. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. The peace of Christ be with you, Always. Let us share with one another a sign of peace. Let us pray together the offering prayer. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism. We may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and gave it for them to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come.
the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your